The story is told of a 20-year-old man who suffered serious head injuries after an accident in 1967. He was in a state of unconsciousness for eight years. His family refused to take him off life support and sold everything they had to keep him alive. Then, one day, after eight years, he woke up to the joy of family and the few friends left. During the period he was asleep, his girlfriend married and has two children. The war in Vietnam was over. He was asleep when Lyndon Johnson was president of the United States. When he woke up Jimmy Carter was president. That means he slept through the presidency of Richard Nixon. Can you imagine sleeping for eight years? Well, there is another person who has been sleeping longer than that. Christians. You. Some of us were active for the Lord in the early days and weeks of our new birth. We would spend hours in solitary places seeking the face of God, communicating and interceding. Then after some time, we told ourselves. We have worked hard enough, let us take a break and shut our eyes for a minute. We took off our armor, put our sword back into its sheath, and laid down to sleep. And we have been sleeping since then. And when we slept the enemy began to prowl and ravage our homes, our workplaces, our communities, and our countries. When those amongst us who were awake poked us to get up. We responded by putting up a, don't disturb, sign. We were not to be bothered while we took our beauty sleep. In the meanwhile, the devil was busy at work. Drugs and pornography are ravaging our very homes, such that it is a miracle if a seventh grader is not into drugs. Religious education, the Bible, and prayers are being banned in public institutions. Violence, rape, murder, and armed groups ravage our streets. Sex and the human body are for sale to any willing buyer. Mothers and would-be mothers have been granted the right to abort babies. The New Age movement emerged. And it brought with it a renewed interest in the occult. Witchcraft, psychics, atheists, agnostics, and Satanists abounded. The church is put under intense pressure to accommodate and conform. The preaching of the gospel is branded offensive and inappropriate. Progressive Christianity, another gospel, and another Christ are heartily embraced because they conform to the times. Drugs pollute our communities, pornography pollutes our minds, and violence ravages our streets. Depravity and abominations are hailed as modern and appropriate. And yet, despite the ongoing moral decay and corruption, you, dear Christian, have hit the snooze button, turned over in your bed, pulled the covers over your head, and continue to sleep. What we are facing now is akin to the time of the prophet Joel. Joel was a prophet in Judah just before the Babylonian armies invaded to destroy Jerusalem and take God's people captive. Joel cried and pleaded for God's children to wake up and repent so that God will spare them from the coming disaster. His warnings are very relevant to us today. If we do not wake up and repent and stand in the gap, the enemy would take our families, communities, and countries as captives. First of all, it's important to recognize that this call is a gracious one. In Joel chapter 2 verse 12, it says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me. God is offering a chance for repentance, even in the midst of wrongdoing and corruption. He is described as gracious, compassionate, and slow to anger, with an abundance of loving kindness. The prophet Hosea also provides a powerful example of God's grace. Hosea's wife, Gomer, had been unfaithful and left him to run after other men. That God commanded Hosea to buy her back and love her. God used their relationship as a symbol of his relationship with his people. In the same way, Jesus has bought us back from our slavery to sin and offered us forgiveness and grace. The Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 to 19. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And Paul adds, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 to 14. So this call to wake up is just as relevant for every Christian today. Despite our flaws and mistakes, God is offering us a chance to turn back to him and experience his forgiveness. God is saying. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow, though they are as red as crimson, they will become like wool. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. God is saying even though your women have poured out libation offerings before idols made of wood. Return to me with all your heart and I will graciously pardon you. Even though your men have taken your little children to sacrifice in the fire. 
Return to me with all your heart and I will graciously pardon you. Even though your hands are stained with innocent blood. Return to me with all your heart and I will graciously pardon you. God is saying to you, I am gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness. I will relent of evil if you will turn. I will forgive you. God is not looking at the gravity and multitude of your sins. He is looking at the sufficiency of the atonement by Jesus Christ. And there is no sin you may have committed that the blood of Jesus cannot atone for. That, dear Christian, is a gracious wake-up call. God's wake-up call is not only gracious, but it is also demanding. God is not asking us to wake up. He is telling us to wake up or else. He was very specific. In Joel chapter 1 verse 13 God says. I want you to gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, O priests, wail, O ministers of the altar. Spend the night in sackcloth O ministers of my God. And in chapter 2 verse 12, he says. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. These calls are not suggestions, but commands. They are commands not just for the leadership, but for the entire congregation, including the old, the young, and even the nursing infants. And those are the things God wants you and I to do as well. God is urgently calling for repentance, telling us to rend our hearts and not just our garments and to seek his forgiveness. Fasting, as well as prayer and repentance, are necessary for revival. We can't continue to do the same things and expect change. To turn the hearts of our children again to the ways of the Lord. That would demand that we fast and pray. This kind does not go out except through fasting and praying. To clear our minds and mouths of the filth of pornography and swear words. That would demand that we fast and pray. For such vile demons are not cast out except through fasting and praying. To stem the tide of progressive Christianity, the preaching of another gospel, and the introduction of another Jesus. That would demand that we fast and pray. For that kind goes out only through fasting and praying. It's time to take God's wake-up call seriously and seek his face with all our hearts. God's wake-up call is not only gracious and demanding, but it is also rewarding. In Joel chapter 2 verses 18 to 27, God promises to be zealous for his land and have mercy on his people. He will send them grain, new wine, and oil, and will drive their enemies away. The land will be fruitful and the people will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. They will praise and worship God and will never be put to shame. God can make up for all the years we have been asleep if we will repent and let him send revival. God's wake-up call offers the opportunity for restoration and blessings. Let's respond to his call and experience the reward of his presence and blessings. God is not asking you to wake up, God is saying, do it or else. I will give you over to my wrath if you don't. Thus saith the Lord. He that has ears to hear let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thank you for listening to us. God bless you. Amen. Thanks for watching.